Welcome uh, on the live stream. Thank you for joining with us today at Eviction Grace and of course to the in, uh, in person congregation. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our uh, sermon series through uh, Acts. We're following the life of Paul and his uh, missionary journey. Uh, we started in Acts 9. We have made it through, let me count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 sermons, and now we are in uh, chapter 18 uh, today. Um, so if you want to go ahead and find chapter 18, we're going to be hanging around there um, all throughout it. So, in the uh, first sermon that we uh, covered, we talked about uh, the Apostle Paul's conversion, um, how a light shone from heaven and Jesus spoke uh, to Paul, but we also learned that his identity uh, was in Christ, not pursuing experiences. We talked about how as Paul started his um his uh, journey, he was mistaken for God by the Gentiles, but he re redirected that glory to God, and he kept his purpose straight. As we continued, uh, we saw some disagreements that Paul had, uh, particularly with John Mark, and how although they departed, they could still keep, once again, their purpose, uh, the main thing, the main thing, and they left both preaching um, the gospel as was taught uh, by Jesus to Paul. Uh, as we continued on, uh, we, we uh, checked out the relationship between Paul and Timothy. I think that was back in Acts 16, and how essentially by the end of their relationship, um, as Paul was about to be executed, he asked Timothy uh, for spiritual grandchildren, as uh, we are the result of today. Then we continued on, and we saw Paul uh, in a moment of distress as a riot uh, broke out and essentially tried to harm him. But it was faithful Christians who studied the scripture um, that God enabled to protect him. And last week, um, the famous Mars Hill sermon, uh, we talked about how Paul addressed the paganism of Athens, Greece, um, and how he redirected um, them to the one true God. But today, we're finally getting out of Acts 17. Uh, and I still didn't cover everything I wanted to cover in Acts 17 even though we discussed it a lot. So, today in Acts uh, 18, we're going to see an important couple, okay, uh, within the life of Paul. We'll take a look at what it means to be a godly couple and to work to be ministers of the gospel at the same time. Now, although we're going to be focusing and kind of honing in on marriage today, for those that are unmarried, live stream or in, uh, in person, consider this as well. Um, we, I'm going to be addressing both sides of the uh, both sides of this morning. I'm talking about godly character, okay? So this sermon is still for everyone, although we're talking about a married couple, okay? So as we get started, I have a few quotes for you. Um, looking at what people have said about marriage throughout the ages, all right? Socrates, he once wrote, by all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln stated that marriage is neither heaven nor hell. It is simply purgatory. <laughs> I got one now. Michel de Montaigne said, which is a French philosopher, he said, a good marriage would be uh, a good marriage would be between a blind wife. And a deaf husband. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> These are hitting two <laughs> right. Joyce Brothers. Who are they? I don't know. <laughs> Marriage is not just spiritual communion. It is also remembered to take out the trash. Mm. G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> yeah. Marriage is an adventure. Like going to war. Now, I was surprised how many bad quotes there are about marriage. When I looked up quotes about marriage, they were all awful, and I had to leave some of these out. Um, particularly, Princess Diana had some strong words about marriage. Okay? Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah <laughs> uh, she had a quote. She said, my marriage had three in it. It was a bit crowded. Yeah. Right. yeah. Pretty bad. But I was surprised. There was more bad quotes about marriage than good. But there, uh, although there are plenty of bad quotes about uh, marriage, Let's look at the great quotes, because marriage is a good thing, okay? Martin Luther writes, Let the wife make the husband glad to come home, and let him make her sorry to see him leave. 
Winston Churchill. My most brilliant achievement was my ability to be able to persuade my wife to marry me. John Florio, who was a, uh, a linguist for King James, he says, a good husband makes a good wife. And Jane Austen, an author that I, I do appreciate, says, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. We see how a marriage is to look in the Bible. We see two identities uh, that become one, communicative, and they are all sold to seeing the salvation of uh, those around them. Following the famous Mars Hill sermon, as we saw last week, with Paul addressing the unknown God, he leaves from Athens and enters Corinth. So let's take another look real quick of what, how far Paul has come in his missionary journey as we've been going through this series. He started here, okay? And this is a map, alright? This is a lot of land. He started here, moved up Sicilia, came around, uh, we saw him in Iconium, Antioch, uh, then he kept going on over, on over to Thessalonica, Berea, here we go about, I think it was said about 240 miles to Athens from Berea, where we saw him last week to here, and now he is in Corinth. Now, you probably notice on this map, Corinth is a seaside city. Man, is that wrong? Or <laughs> alliteration. It's a seaside city, and it became a hot spot for Paul's activity for the remainder of his life, um, and numerous ministry allies were forged here. So let's go ahead and start reading. Let's just read Acts 18, verse 1 to 3. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, uh, lately come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because uh, that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Alright? So this is the first time, not the last time, we're going to see Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila. Um, let's read a few quick facts on these guys. And in those first three verses, we see a lot of information. So first of all, Priscilla and Aquila were Roman Jews who were displaced by the infamous uh, emperor Claudius. When they became displaced, they went from Rome to Greece, where they were a little bit more welcome. And also, as tent makers, Corinth was a prominent trade city. All right? So they, they had it made right here. Um, Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned six times in the Bible across four different books. Now here's what I want y'all to get and what I'm going to kind of hone in on today. Out of the six times they were mentioned in the Bible, they were never mentioned apart. Never. Not once. Not even remotely. Whenever they're mentioned from this point on, they're mentioned as Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla. Every time. We don't see that often in the Bible. That in a phrase, they are always mentioned together. Never apart. So today we're going to discuss the beauty of marriage, rightly divided of course, and how, um, and the importance of these two characters in scripture, and what we can glean from it. So I'm going to go way back, starting off. It's generally well known that man was created first, placed in the Garden of Eden, and from man God made woman. God realized that man essentially um, was not complete. He said it's not good to be alone without the woman in Genesis 2.18. And he created the two married as in one flesh. Okay? Um, let's go to Genesis 2.18. So this is going to be one of the basis for our whole sermon today. Genesis 2.18. Or 2.24, I apologize. So in Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his wife and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be made one flesh. This is not the only instance that this, uh, this verse is mentioned. It's actually quoted uh, three times in the New Testament, this same verse. In Matthew 19, 5, Jesus quotes this verse. 
In Mark 10, 8, Jesus quotes this verse. In Ephesians 5, 31, the Apostle Paul uh, quotes this verse. All right? There are few better examples of two people becoming one flesh than Priscilla and Aquila. Whenever you hear of Priscilla, you hear of Aquila. Whenever you hear of Aquila, you hear of Priscilla. Now, I'm going to reread Acts 18.3. In Acts 18.3, it says, And because he was of the same craft, craft he abode with them and wrought, for by the occupation they were tent makers. So here Paul is, he's in a new city, and he meets this couple. All right? Uh, one of the, the, way, the things that they bonded over, essentially, was that Paul was a tent maker, Priscilla was a tent maker, and Aquila was a tent maker. You see, Paul didn't just go around preaching and taking money to support himself. Wherever he went, he would also support himself as well in various matters of way, uh, in various ways. One of which is a tent maker. All right, I feel I feel Paul's plight here. All right, being as teachers, bivocational, and a pastor as well, it's essentially the same idea. Okay, he, uh, Paul is supporting himself. And he uh, gets in touch with Aquila and Priscilla. Also, it's interesting to notice. Paul was Roman. All right? Priscilla and Aquila were Roman. Paul was Jewish. Priscilla and Aquila were Jewish. Uh, Paul was a tent maker. Priscilla and Aquila were a tent maker. We don't really see uh, that many people that similar to Paul, at least his background, than we do with Priscilla and Aquila. Yes. So it's kind of like Paul used his gifts that God already ordained in him to fulfill the purpose of God's will. That's so exactly what it's like. They yeah. were just two teams together. Mm -hmm. one, one team together. Yep, that's right. They came together in the, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, and we're about to see a little bit more how they contributed to this purpose. As we go, to, uh, as we go on, um, they found similarities. Uh, and through these similarities... Uh, they could relate, they could, uh, it's part of their worship. We are called to live together, where, whether it is here on earth or whether it is in heaven. We have a fellowship. You don't have to turn there uh, unless you want to. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. It says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. So whether we die... Uh, whether we're with God in heaven, whether we're with God uh, on earth by the Holy Spirit, we live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and do what? Edify one another, even as ye also do. So, in, in that scripture, Paul tells the Thess uh, Thessalonian church, right before he got to Corinth, okay, essentially, he tells them to uh, do two things. Comfort one another and edify. That word edify means to build up uh, each other, okay? Just like you would build a house, just like you would build a tall tower, you would edify it, okay? So he's telling people in the church to build up each other, just as, right to see, Priscilla and Aquila do. Now, take the seriousness of the fellowship we have with other Christians, and for those that are married, let's look at your spouse and ask, do you see your spouse as an extension of yourself, Okay? If so, I'm asking you to take it a little bit deeper. When you look at your spouse, do you see yourself? Okay? The language in Scripture is very strong. It says one flesh, one person. Okay? You are one person once this covenant is made. Okay? And particularly in God's eyes. If, you, if I were to make a history book, for example, it would be a failure if they, uh, they listed me as Jacob Paris. It'd be a failure. A success in a history book would be, be me being titled Hallie and Jacob Harris. Okay? As a Christian, we are one person. As a Christian marriage, we are one person. And if she's not included in this image of one flesh, it was a failure. Alright? Scripture says it's not good to be alone. It's not good for me to be alone. Nothing has changed. Okay? One of the uh, primary purposes of marriage is we are partners in ministry and we support each other. Just like Priscilla and Aquila with tent making. It says they were both tent makers. Okay? Teaching school and encouraging others, that's what we do. So, co laboring in marriage and outside of marriage is an act of worship. In the following verses that I'm about to read, Paul addresses a group of people 
That includes husband, wives, and people that aren't even married. And this is what he tells them. If you want to turn with me, go to Colossians 3.17. I'll give you all a page number. Colossians 3.17, that's page 580. And we're going to be reading through 23. Could have started at 18, but I had to go back to 17. And what whatsoever you do in the word of deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands, as they sit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wife and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye servant as an pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And here's what I want you to catch. Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, as in humanity. Okay? Yes, it just makes sense because if you're doing everything with the heart and the grace of God, no one gets left behind because right. you're fulfilling the purpose and you're fulfilling the promise. Yep. That's true. And, and uh, it's, it's, as you said that too, I was looking right above it where it says servants. Who are we? We are servants of mm -hmm. Christ. All right? This is a pretty inclusive, uh, pretty inclusive message here. Everybody is in this picture. Uh, all Christians. Good point. Good point. So, now, we are here in court. All right, but the message doesn't end here. Okay, the epic of Priscilla and Aquila does not just get left behind when Paul leaves um, Corinth. I'll show you how dedicated Priscilla and Aquila were to the ministry and the goal of the gospel. Okay, they went from Corinth. Paul left Corinth. He continues his missionary journey. He goes to Ephesus. Guess who travels overseas with him? Priscilla and Aquila. They were that committed to the ministry, and were, uh, the ministry of Paul. And, and many of you here have committed to helping and enriching grace, uh, reach other people for the gospel. For that, I'm very appreciative. All right, I see a lot of similarity here. Um, now we're going to look at how this couple worked together to fulfill their goals. First of all, their presence affected their community greatly. The presence of Priscilla and Aquila was enough to make a difference. In Ephesus, there was a Christian Jew that began speaking in the temples boldly, named Apollos. So, here we are in Ephesus. It's modern-day Turkey. Um, and on the scene comes this guy named Apollos. Where he came from? I don't know. All right? But scripture, uh, scripture, his story begins here. So, Apollos is in Ephesus, going into the synagogues of the Jews and preaching. We, was, we see him later become a leader in the church. Let's go down to Acts 18, 24 through 26. We're going to kind of pick up on the life of Apollos. Get back to Acts 18, 24 through 26. That's page 526. And it says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, that is Egypt, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Now catch this. Knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him into, uh, unto him, and expounded uh, unto him the way of God more perfectly. So you had this man named Apollos. Now Apollos was still... I'm going to use the word stuck, okay? What he was preaching was what John the Baptist preached, all right? He had only heard about John the Baptist and how John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus, okay? Uh, and therefore, he was teaching that to be baptized, be saved, and so forth, so forth, all right? Um, little did he know that Jesus has arrived, that Jesus had died on the cross, rose again for his justification, and that uh, we have this little thing called grace, Okay? Actually, a rather big thing called grace. Um, Apollos was preaching what he knew, the gospel of, of the kingdom. 
Now, I know this because of the next verse, um, where it talks about how they expound, uh, expounded uh, to him on that. So, when this happened, well, when Priscilla and Aquila saw what was going on, they pulled him aside and says, you know that message you're teaching about John the Baptist? Well, we have the other half to it. Okay? It's like reading a novel, but half of it's gone. Okay? They pull him aside, they talk to him, and they say, we have the other half to the story. That person that John the Baptist was preparing for, he is here now. He has gone back to heaven, and he has sent down the Holy Spirit. Apollo's life was forever changed. Why? Because Priscilla and, Aquilus, uh, Priscilla and Aquila came together and offered their home to him and spoke with him on this. Um, it's called ministry. Uh, in turn, once he learned about the grace of God and what Jesus Christ had done for him, he did this, uh, 27 to 28. It says, And when he was disposed to, uh, to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who then he would come, help them much uh, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus, Christ, uh, Jesus was Christ. Aquila and Priscilla became Christians. Priscilla and Aquila traveled. Apollos became a Christian. Apollos convinced other Jews to become Christians. You remember that sermon earlier where we were talking about spiritual grandchildren? It happened rather fast in, uh, in this story. It says he mightily convinced the Jews because of the grace that he was given and the, the, uh, the gospel that he gave. He taught his niche and saw many Jews come to salvation. Grace in the story essentially created a chain reaction. Show it, someone receives it, what do they do? They go show it again. Yes, ma'am. Kind of like surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded, like you see, you can be evenly yoked together. Yes, that's right, the body of Christ. That's exactly correct. And um, here, the, the couple, as we're about to see uh, in Romans and everything else, that they continue to grow, um, this happens again in the story of Priscilla and Aquila. They were a very contagious people. I'll say that, contagious in a good way. Um, so, the presence of Priscilla and Aquila was important. Also, their godly home was an important story, uh, an important part to the story. Another way that the couple work together to serve Christ is to offer up their home for the church to grow, which is incredible. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16, 19. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. So this is just about the end. This really is the end of 1 Corinthians. And that's page 567, by the way. So, there's a few letters to where at the end of it, we see um, Paul thanking or greeting Priscilla and Aquila. And this is what he says in verse uh, 16 through 19. He says, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now, for them, that was a risky move. We've seen Paul, um, as Paul went to a lot of these cities, how did it end, you know? A riot came, they beat him up, they throw him out the city gates, almost dead. He gets up, he does it again. All right? So this was a risky move to allow Christians to meet in, his, in their home. But that's not the part of the story that I want to focus on. Okay? Um, that they just let him use four walls for a place of safety. That's not what I want to focus on. What gets me in this story is the fact that they had a home worth sharing. Okay? That's the beauty of the story. I'm not just talking about a house, four walls, and a roof. Forget that part of the story. It's what they made of that home. It's what they made of their relationship. They had a bond between the two. They had communication. Guess what? They had integrity. As Christians, okay, if we cannot share, if we cannot share that, then it's probably not, um, how do I say this? There's some things we need to reevaluate there, okay, as a couple. Um, they were entirely committed to each other in the gospel and accurately teaching scripture. This kind of joy of marriage was only possible because of God's model for marriage. God had instilled a model as we're about to look at, and we're going to end on uh, talking about this. Um, and this model goes this way, okay? 
Now hear me out. Sometimes when reading these verses it sounds harsh, but it's actually pretty incredible. The model that God gave was this. Wives submit, husbands love, Christ leads. Three components to it. I'll say it again. Wives submit, husbands love, Christ leads. It is a God-ordained model. Uh, we're going to go to two more places in Scripture today. Let's first of all go back to Colossians 3. Page 580. In Colossians 3, it says this, in verse 18. Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands as it is fit in the Lord, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Okay? Now, we're going to see a very similar instruction in Ephesians 5, 22-23. Ephesians 5, 22-23. That's right, we're getting some scriptural mobility here today. Ephesians 5, 22, that's page 576. We're going to read down to 33. And as I read this, this verse is going to have some, it's going to have some interesting uh, sayings in there. Uh, I'm going to stay discussing uh, what the overall idea of this model. Okay. If you all have questions at the end about some of the contents in this, we'll talk about it. All right. So Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Where did we just hear that? Colossians. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything, be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. That verse, every time I read it, is so beautiful, okay? It says, as Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? He died for the church, all right? He hung on a cross. He was beaten, scorned. Uh, it got to the point where he couldn't even carry his own cross. All right. In verse twenty-five, really absorb that. That he might sanctify and cleanse with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Uh, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man has uh, ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she has reverence for her husband. This is the God-ordained uh, model for a good marriage. Um, sometimes these scriptures, is, uh, it's hard to digest because this one singular word in there, submit. The word submit has almost become a bad word in popular culture. Okay? Um, but in a biblical model, submission and love come hand in hand, back and forth, uh, intertwined. Um, there's a number of reasons uh, that these verses can, may cause some offense today, but particularly that word submit has caused controversy. Um, but for men here, okay? I'm going to speak to men. I don't know why I looked at you in the forums. All right. Um, in verse 25, once again, I want to read this. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And verse 33. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, even as himself, even as himself, and the wife see that she has reverence for her husband. The love in marriage is given sacrificially, even as Christ gave himself for the church. He is to love his wife even more than himself. Amen? And this goes back once again to where we started, okay? One flesh. How would you treat yourself? 
But we need to think about that as in the flesh. We are one flesh together intertwined from marriage. It's immensely powerful scripture and spirit driven. These instructions come with the expectation that you are living as one person. If you read it outside of that context, it makes no sense. Why would we live this model if you are not living as one person? If you are living as two separate people, this model makes no sense and it's, it would be easy to disregard. Yes, ma'am. This is kind of like when you see the faults of others, you neglect the faults of yourself because there's only one perfect person, and that was Jesus Christ. Yep, that's absolutely yep. correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You need to write that down. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Outside of this kind of marriage, of course, this model would not work. But when you are one person living on purpose in marriage, you... And you two can be a Priscilla and an Aquila. This is the recipe for an incredibly fruitful marriage. And once again, as I'm about to close, and I'll, I'll get that, uh, that thought, as I'm about to close, um, remember this message isn't only necessarily for married people. It's, it's something, um, hopefully before you get married, uh, people get married, uh, they have some self-introspection and things of that nature too to see if this is the direction that it's going. Yes. Well, how it could apply to single people is that, I mean, simply a marriage is supposed to represent the church mm -hmm. and God. So, like, we are the church. So, as the wife to God, we're supposed to submit to God. God's already done his half of the work in which he loves us as himself. He's already done that. So, now it's our job to submit and to serve him. So, you know, I kind of look at it that way. Because even if you're married, you're still ultimately submitting to God. So going back to going back to the, the servant part of it. Yeah, exactly. Part. Yep. That's what you're saying. And yes. So it's kind of like the blueprint to humanity. Yep. In a sense. Essentially, mm -hmm. and uh, think about it. that's how it all got started too. Um, from Adam and Eve, what all came out from, the, from that way. You're, you're yeah, right. and because they had didn't have the right kind of marriage. Mm -hmm. Sin came about. Yeah. That I mean, I think that shows the importance of marriage, but just that relationship of us as people with God. So Kennedy's right. That's me too. With that being said, I would like to close in prayer. And then, uh, any questions or comments or anything of that nature, uh, we'll talk about it. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for everything you do. Uh, as a personal prayer, I thank you for my wife, Father, and the, uh, the things that I've learned from her as well as I prepare for this sermon. Um, I, I pray that you continue to uh, be with, uh, watch over us throughout this week. Uh, we have your providence. Um, and uh, as we continue to go through Acts, Father, um, that we see, um, we, can, we continue to pull faithfully your truth from Scripture, Father, and not put our own truth into Scripture, Father. Um, with that being said, I ask this all, in the holy, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And thank you to the live stream for joining with us today. If y'all have any questions, comments, and or prayer requests, leave them at the bottom and we'll get back with you soon. Thank you.